Benny Bastet, and I'm the director of the International Studies Institute, and this is really a team effort with um, the associate director, faculty, and staff uh, working together to make this happen. Today is the last lecture, so it's a bit bittersweet, but it's also very exciting that today's speaker is one of our very own students, Julie Williams, uh, who is a PhD candidate here in English, and um, has also taught her own courses in the English department on Native American history, um, lit liter literature, and um, is working on uh, her dissertation, Embodying the West, a Literary and Cultural History of Environment, Body, and Belief. The dissertation examines discourses of health and embodiment in the American West from 1880 to the present. Like everyone else involved in the International Studies Institute um, lectures, uh, Julie works in an interdisciplinary fashion, and she actually proposed to do a presentation that looks both at Los Alamos and Hiroshima and how the legacy of um, atomic um, uh, experimentation and the atomic bomb uh, has come to our days. She's the inaugural recipient of the Elizabeth and George Arms American Literary Studies Research Assistantship, and uh, in 2011 and 12, she was the recipient of the Center for Regional Studies Hector Torres Fellowship, the late Professor Torres uh, UNM. And uh, she has also received the awards from the Feminist Research Institute here at UNM and the Southwest Popular American Culture Association. She's very, very distinguished. And um, her scholarship focuses on Western literature, queer and feminist theories, Native American literature, disability studies, and the atomic age. And she has already published her work in the edited collection, The Silence of Fallout, Nuclear criticism in a post Cold World War, and online in the publication Plaza Dialogues in Language and Literature. Her talk today is uh, also supported by CELAC, the Center for English Language and Culture here at UNM, and I'm very thankful to them for their support. The whole lecture series has been, they said, a uh, uh, it takes a village to create it, and we will be updating our website with um, uh, a list of all the departments and programs and um, schools on campus that have uh, supported us, as well as um, extramural support we received. And um, finally, the commentator today is Manuel Montoya, my colleague from uh, the Anderson School of Business, the Business School. And uh, he has presented in the ISI lecture series and conferences in the past. He's always ready to say yes uh, <laughs> when, uh, when I ask him, even though he carries more load than probably five faculty together, <laughs> and uh, uh, myself included, I have to put it in, he's uh, really everywhere. everywhere. And um, it's actually rewarding for me to have had this opportunity to bring you faculty from not only arts and sciences, including our dean, Dean Pesini, but also from the law school, from the uh, business school, and from the School of Architecture and Planning, where I also hold an appointment. And uh, with that, I think we can uh, go on with Judy. So thank you all for being here, and thank you to the International Studies Institute and CELAC, and especially to Eleni. Um, I was the graduate assistant in International Studies last year, and she's been a really wonderful mentor, um, the least of which is providing me the opportunity to share this research today. So today I'm going to talk about the literary and cultural narratives that we've created about nuclear weapons, and from there get at the issue of why how this is represented in culture matters, and the way that we depict the development, use, history, and future of atomic weapons is significant. I want to approach the issue of representation through a variety of different angles while getting at this. So I'm going to start by looking at the development of the atomic bomb in the Manhattan Project here in New Mexico, then turn to 
depictions of their use in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then return to the Southwest looking at cultural depictions um, during the Cold War era and how the mushroom cloud permeated American culture during the 50s. So how does the frame of an issue or an image affect that we, the way that we read, see, or conceive of it, and then why does this issue of representation matter? I think this is particularly important when you're considering the issue of atomic weapons within the context of this lecture series, which has been themed around the topic peace from conflict to resolution. So when you're thinking of the conflict part of atomic weapons, one obviously has to address their use in Japan. That's what immediately comes to mind. But what if we consider this quote by Rebecca Solnit? Nuclear war, whether you are for it or against it, is supposed to be a terrible thing that might happen someday, not something that has been going on all along. And that's a quote from her book, Savage Dreams, a journey into the hidden wars of the American West. As this quote makes clear, the way the issue is presented affects what we see as conflict. In one way, we've never had a bomb dropped on the United States as an act of war, but the weapons that were developed and tested in New Mexico and Nevada, the ongoing storage of nuclear waste at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, which just last year had a big to-do um, about <laughs> a leak going, happening because of the wrong kitty litter being used as an absorbent, <laughs> um, the fires that threatened Los Alamos a couple years ago, all of these things are not without um, effect. In Savage Dreams, Solnit traces the history of atomic testing in the American West and the way that this Cold War era testing followed and extended the logic of manifest destiny and westward expansion. She calls this a hidden war, and when this sort of narrative frame is set upon the history, it expands the way that we look at nuclear conflict. What can we learn from the literary and cultural history of atomic development, and then how is this different from looking at the angle through a more political lens? As John Treat states in Writing Ground Zero, his comprehensive analysis of atomic bomb literature, quote, we should study, we study atomic bomb literature not so much to know what physically happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the publications of the United States Strategic Bombing Survey will tell you that much, but rather to give us the psychological means to act aware of that knowledge. In his essay, No Apocalypse, Not Now, Jacques Derrida also approaches this issue, as he claims that in the absence of nuclear war, the only way that society has to deal with the presence of nuclear weapons in the world is to write about them. World powers so far have avoided the nuclear war, but the threat remains as nuclear weapons remain, and people must find a way to reconcile that in their psyche. Derrida claims that writing and creating narratives acts as a psychological reconciliation to this threat that atomic weapons pose. People make meaning out of the world through the use of narrative, and the stories that we tell about the use of nuclear weapons frame the way that we understand this conflict and the way that we address the issue of resolution. In this presentation, I hope to blur, blur the idea of what constitutes conflict in hopes of opening up the narrative structure of nuclear conflict will allow us to act aware of this history in a creative manner going into the future. So the beginning I've chosen to trace this history to is the Manhattan Project, although you could trace it back earlier to the splitting of the atom or even to Marie Curie and her experiments with radium and radiation, which won her several Nobel Prizes um, in 1898 and 1911. But I chose the Manhattan Project as the beginning because it marks the history of atomic weapons as both decidedly local to us here in New Mexico, but also as international in a way we don't often consider. The Manhattan Project site, now Los Alamos National Labs, is situated next to land that belongs to San Ildefonso Pueblo, and it was land that once did belong to the Pueblo. There are still sacred sites um, on Los Alamos ground that San Ildefonso has been in negotiations to do ceremonies on and get access to. The location is important to consider um, when thinking about the stories we tell about nuclear weapons and why they were developed, because the Pueblo is a sovereign nation in its relations with the US government. 
And the connection to an effacement of the Pueblo in the history of Los Alamos reveals that World War II was not the only conflict that influenced the Manhattan Project. As rhetoric about manifest destiny, conquest, national origins, and the frontier was carried from the Indian Wars in the 19th century into the 20th century with the development of atomic weapons. The Manhattan Project incorporated the language of Manifest Destiny and the Western Frontier into its attempts to conquer the atom. And this rhetoric can be seen from the very beginning. There's a coded exchange between physicists as they compare the first successful, successful fission chain reaction to the European discovery of America. They say, the Italian, Italian navigator has landed in the New World. How did he find the natives? Very friendly. And this was a coded telegram message. Um, at this point, the US was in a race. There were rumors that Hitler was also working on developing an atomic bomb. So everything was very secretive, encoded language to avoid any sort of um, information being leaked out. So this is how they decide to code the success of this chain reaction. The nuclear scientists and military elites here believe they were embarking on a scientific journey of discovery and they're creating a new world in this process. They viewed their achievement to be on par with Christopher Columbus's discovery of America in 1492 and they're exploring this new nuclear frontier here where the particles were the modern equivalent of friendly natives, friendly because of the success of the phys physicist experiments. American Indians were positioned as both the first Americans and as a counter concept to the American throughout the 19th century. And this discourse of genealogical connection and othering informed a number of Cold War projects. Weapon scientists, for example, explicitly referenced Pueblo religion in their experimental work on nuclear fission. They named the labs where they conducted their experiments kivas, referencing the um, sacred rooms used in Pueblo ceremonies. Even today, a computational fluid dynamics software is still named Kiva. Um, the Pueblo and their land here become an origin point and lend a sense of the sacred to what's going on in the Manhattan Project. This appropriation of the term Kiva to describe a building that is part of the nuclear concept is just the first example of how nuclear weapons production is infused with a sense of borrowed mysticism to lend it this sort of religiosity in what they're doing. So the borrowed religious imagery connected to atomic weapons is seen elsewhere. After the science, scientists at Los Alamos developed these atomic weapons, they trucked them down to White Sands, New Mexico, because they had to test the bomb to make sure it was going to work before they put it to use. Um, so here you see the test site. You can see the crater left by the explosion. And over on the right, you see Robert Oppenheimer, the head scientist of the Manhattan Project, and Leslie Groves, the head of the military operations, talking around the charred remains of the tower that was built to simulate dropping a bomb from an airplane. Oppenheimer, speaking later of this moment after the bomb was tested, connected his project to the Bhagavad Gita, a book important in Hindu philosophy. Oppenheimer's comparison to the Bhagavad Gita here is, is significant, not only because it's another moment of borrowed religiosity connected to this project. His comparison to this story situates his position 
as similar to Arjuna's, the warrior who at the beginning of the text has a crisis of conscience when about to go to war. Arjuna is convinced by the god Krishna that he must fight, as that is his duty and he must serve his role in life. He's an archer, so that's his karma, is to go into that battle. Through Oppenheimer's comparison here, he not only calls upon imagery of destruction and creation, two sides of the same coin in Hindu philosophy, but also positions himself and the other scientists as serving their role, even though their choice to do so seems quite destructive. This connection to Hindu philosophy serves as a psychological distancing for Oppenheimer, as situating the story of atomic weapons alongside an ancient tale allows him to construct a narrative where there is meaning rather than simply destruction in his role in the development of atomic weapons. So we can already see how narratives are constructed and rhetoric and imagery are used when situating atomic weapons and we've only just covered their beginning. One distinction I wanna make here before I turn to the use of atomic weapons in Japan is between atomic bomb literature and nuclear literature. I titled this talk Nutri Nuclear Literature because I thought it was important to include the history of the atomic Southwest considering our location and because of how I wanted to approach the topic of the lecture series moving from conflict to peace. But atomic bomb literature is a literature that's particular to Japan and depicts the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and their aftermath. Nuclear literature, on the other hand, is often speculative fiction, imagining the what if of a possible nuclear winter or a nuclear war. Upon atomic bomb literature, however, deals not with the what if of nuclear weapons, but the reality of what happened when they were used. In this mode of representation, it differs from speculative fiction. It's not imagining horror, but depicting and representing the reality of it. The immediate aftermath of the bombings and the ongoing effects are both the realm of atomic bomb literature. As Toyoshima Yoshio wrote in October 1945, the time has come for literature to engage science, not to win a victory, but rather to assimilate in the name of man what science has wrought. The problem is not whether it can actually be assimilated or not. One can predict, given the present turn of events in the world, that there will be some people capable of comprehending what has happened. But I wonder, what I wonder is whether those people will continue to be human or whether unable to survive as human, they will stumble into a tragic abyss. So a lot of it is about depicting what it means to be human in the world where this happens. Um, I've given you just a couple of pictures of Hiroshima. The top one shows the one of the few remaining buildings at the epicenter of the bombing. And that building today is a Peace Park in Hiroshima. So the first widely read literary work that attempted to assimilate what science has wrought was John Hersey's Hiroshima. It was originally published in the New Yorker and it took up the entire August 31st, 1946 edition. So it was just a year, about a year after, a little over a year after the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima. And from that New Yorker edition, it was quickly turned into a book reaching press just two months later. The flat style of Hersey's narration follows six characters through the morning of the bombing and its aftermath, and it presents these horrors in a very journalistic style, as he was in fact a journalist, one of the first American journalists who was allowed into Hiroshima after the bombing. His story was published in America when only scientific accounts of the bombing were allowed in occupied Japan. So this is really the first account that the world had of what had gone on. There was only the sort of very government controlled uh, technical documents. This is the first more humanizing side to the story that the world saw. And his account, well widely read and well known, differs in tone and style of representation from the literature written by Kubakusha, the Japanese term for atomic affected people. As recently as 1985 in Hiroshima, one out of every seven people identified as Hibakusha, and one out of every six in Nagasaki. Nationwide in Japan, about one out of every 300 people is believed to be an atomic affected person. 
The reality of what this meant was not known either in Japan or the rest of the world in the aftermath of the bombing due to the close control of the information that was out about this. And the only details released were those controlled by the US government. So the United States Strategic Bombing Survey Summary Report is an example of the type of narrative that the world saw long before they saw any literature written by Hibakusha. So this sort of narrative makes Hersey's journalistic style look very effusive. So Hersey is not really big on details about the destruction, but this, as you can imagine, is even less so. So I'm going to open up <coughs> and read a part to you, just to give you an idea of what the world was seeing up until a year or two after the bombing. So I'll read a couple of paragraphs, just in this example. Hiroshima is built on a broad river delta. It is flat and little above sea level. The total city area is 26 square miles, but only seven square miles at the center were densely built up. The principal industries, which had been greatly expanded during the war, were located on the periphery of the city. The population of the city had been reduced from approximately 340,000 to 245,000 as a result of a civilian defense evacuation program. The explosion caught the city by surprise. An alert had been sounded, but in view of the small number of planes, the all clear had been given. Consequently, the population had not taken shelter. The bomb exploded a little northwest of the center of the built up area. Everyone who was out in the open and was exposed to the initial flash suffered serious burns were not protected by clothing. Over four square miles in the center of the city were flattened to the ground with the exception of some 50 reinforced concrete buildings, most of which were internally gutted and many of which suffered structural damage. Most of the people in the flattened area were crushed or pinned down by the collapsing buildings or flying debris. Shortly thereafter, numerous fires started, a few from the direct heat of the dash, but most from overturned charcoal cooking stoves or other secondary causes. These fires grew in size, merging into a general conflagration fanned by a wind sucked into the center of the city by the rising heat. The civilian defense organization was overwhelmed by the completeness of the destruction, and the spread of fire was halted more by the air rushing toward the center of the conflagration than by efforts of the firefighting organization. Approximately 60,000 to 70,000 people were killed and 50,000 were injured. Of approximately 90,000 buildings in the city, 65,000 were rendered unusable and almost all the remainder received at least light superficial damage. The underground utilities of the city were undamaged except where they crossed bridges over the rivers cutting through the city. So that's an example of what the world saw and knew about Hiroshima. The same clinical language was sometimes used in atomic bomb literature, specifically atomic bomb poetry. Clinical language like this, so insufficient to express the atrocity that it describes, shows how all language is inadequate to depict the world of the Hibakusha. The language of authorities riddled with this cruel type of irony is the same language used in these poems, which uses the reversal associated with irony to reorder the experience of the reader and show them how language is insufficient to express such an atrocity. This same type of language is used in Hara Tamiki's poem, This is a Human Being. So this is a poem from Atomic Bomb Landscapes. This is a human being. Please note what changes have been affected by the atomic bomb. The body is grotesquely bloated. Male and female characteristics are indistinguishable. Oh, that black, seared, smashed, and festering face from whose swollen lips oozes a voice. Help me. In faint, quiet words, this is a human being, the face of a human being. In Tamiki's work, we can see an example of how atomic bomb poetry works and how writers struggle to represent their experiences as Hibakusha. In Hara's Summer Flowers, a documentary memoir about Hiroshima, one of the most widely read pieces of atomic bomb literature, along with Ota Yoko's memoir, City of Corpses, and Kenzaburo Oe's story, The Crazy Iris. Hara is known for summer flowers, but he found throughout numerous points in that memoir that prose failed him. And he turns to poetry as a language which he hoped would say more than it says referring not only to these sights and sounds that he recalls, 
but also making the reader ponder more closely the use and meaning of words. Prose as mere reference to events, such as we saw in Hersey's Hiroshima or the strategic bombing survey, is not enough to describe the event of the atomic bomb. Yet traditional literary devices, like metaphor and simile, also fail. The bombing was not like anything else. No comparisons can be made. Hara was not alone in this type of feeling that language is failing to describe the aftermath. As Otoyoko says about writing his memoir, City of Corpses, surprisingly enough, the city of death that the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima created makes a very difficult subject matter for literature. The new methods of description and expression necessary to write cannot be found in the repertoire of an established writer. I have not seen hell, nor do I acknowledge the existence of the Buddhist hell. Losing sight of the exaggeration involved, people often spoke of the experience of the atomic bomb as hell or scenes of hell. It would probably have been a simple matter if one were able to express the bitterness of that experience in terms of that ready-made concept, hell. I was absolutely unable to depict the truth without first creating a new terminology. Hara's most famous poems achieve their effect in stages organized around an ironic revelation. So the apparently simple line, this is a human being, needs to be reread by the reader afterwards, like festering, swollen, male and female characteristics indistinguishable. So words like seared smash, the help me, all of those lines make you reconsider what this human being is, what is humanity. And works like this are not attempting to reassure the reader, but rather kind of dislocate them. Excuse me, I don't, uh, the italics are distracting. I can't figure out what the rules are. So he wrote this in a type of Japanese script that was used for official documents. Uh -huh. So this is the best way that the translation <laughs> I found depicted that. And I think it's another sort of device where you're meant to be dislocated from that. It has no meaning that you can figure out, like why this word is italicized and why one isn't. Because depicting that sort of scene is just that yeah. dislocating experience. So he's yeah. trying to, in every form through the words he's using, the way he's writing it in this particular Japanese script, he's showing that experience. So returning now from this atomic bomb literature to representations of the atomic bomb in post-World War II America, which looked dramatically different. In order to explain the way that America dealt with this topic, I want to use the idea of spectacle in order to capture the absurdity of how atomic weapons were incorporated into post-war America. Guy Debord's The Society of the Spectacle. Debord was a French theorist. He was part of the group of situationists. And his ideas about spectacle helped to explain a world where it was possible to take an image connected with the weapon which caused so much suffering at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, the mushroom cloud, and turn it into an icon designed to attract tourists to watch te test detonations of these weapons just a few years later. Debord explains how images have become detached from experiences and now exist purely in the realm of representation. In this realm, an image can be utilized as an advertisement, entertainment, and news object simultaneously, as they are all mere expressions of the overall spectacle. So I gave you a picture that kind of illustrates this <coughs> working. So there's a, a easel set up with a painting that's depicting the landscape. And it's a very realistic painting. So you have a hard time seeing what is reality and what's an image in that painting. So this background helps explain the cultural history of Cold War era engagement with atomic weapons in the US. The separation from the historic use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and this continued threat of nuclear war throughout the Cold War, turned the mushroom cloud into a simulation, an image liberated from its reference to reality, which the media then used to shape the cultural consciousness in a way which calmed the nation's fears about nuclear weapons. Las Vegas seized upon this image of the mushroom cloud as its symbol of its status as the atomic city. 
It was the closest place to the Nevada Proving Grounds, which were just 65 miles away. And you can see here that when the tests were done, you could see the mushroom cloud from the strip. So this testing provided an opportunity to capitalize on the country's new obsession with all things nuclear after the first nationally televised test in the spring of 1952. And an erasure of historical significance is evident in the way that we see the entrance of atomic testing into national consciousness, which then sparks a craze in consumer culture. So you start to see the mushroom cloud popping up. Soon after this televised test, designers picked up on atomic style, which incorporated rays and spheres simulating the path of electrons around the nucleus of an atom. So you can see that type of design in a lot of mid-century objects. Um, you see it on a dinner plate, the woman skiing in the wall clock. Um, and through the use of this style in so many cultural forms, designers of the 50s were shaping the cultural consciousness of their time in addition to just the objects that they're making. And the use of atomic style in these common household items made this image safe and domestic rather than a frightening technology. So this is a picture from the Atomic Museum here in Albuquerque. It's for atomic dish detergent. Have a blast in your kitchen. And it even made it as far as Rome, Italy. So this is a picture of a woman holding a picture. So you can see the layers of images going on here in this. A picture of a mushroom cloud. And her hairstylist has styled her hair to look like the mushroom cloud. Um, and she's a 22-year-old beauty in Rome, Italy, displaying her new atomic hairstyle. So back to Las Vegas, and it was perfectly situated to profit from the atomic testing. So geographically, it's closest to the test site, but also culturally, it's a city which has always marketed itself as a place where you can go experience the unusual. Soon after the detonations became regularized, there was a test scheduled for every three weeks. Las Vegas hotels and casinos began hosting viewing parties where guests were entertained by showgirls, gambling, and atomic cocktails as they waited for the ultimate spectacle of the atomic blast. The blasts were usually scheduled around four in the morning um, just due to weather conditions. So people would party all night up until that, and then this was kind of the penultimate experience. These parties were introduced as a way to capitalize on the atomic crane that had inundated, craze that had inundated pop culture and the military influence that was starting to be really heavy in the region due to all the testing going on. The Chamber of Commerce promoted these blasts as a cultural experience, and it issued a calendar which listed the times detonations were supposed to occur and suggestions for the best places to view the blasts, giving a boost to local businesses. And then as a way to attract even more tourists, they started publicizing the Showgirl Beauty Pageant, which is another staple of Las Vegas. So there's documentation of at least four different women who were crowned with titles that were variations of Miss Atomic Bomb from the years 1952 to 1957. The first atomic pinup girl, Las Vegas actress and dancer Candace King, appeared as Miss Atomic Blast in photographs that accompanied a newspaper story on atomic testing as a tourist attraction. And the story appeared in the Dixon, Illinois Evening Telegraph and the Statesville, North Carolina Daily Record on May 9, 1952. The fact that newspapers in Illinois and North Carolina ran this story shows that the rest of the nation was buying into this craze and fascinated with what Las Vegas was, how Las Vegas was situating atomic testing. The caption that accompanied this article reads, radiating loveliness instead of deadly atomic particles, Candace King, actress appearing at Last Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, dazzled US Marines who participated in recent atomic maneuvers at Yucca Flats. They bestowed on her the title of Miss Atomic Blast, finding her as awe-inspiring in another way, as was the Big Bang. The language used in this caption reveals the national attitude not only about the aesthetics of atomic testing, but also about those connected to the female body. The female body in the beginning is distanced from the atomic detonation 
as it radiates loveliness instead of deadly atomic particles. However, a connection between the two is formed through their interactions with the Marines, who are dazzled by both. In the end, the body of Miss Atomic Blast inspires awe, as does the Big Bang, and both are viewed voyeuristically by a culture where feminine beauty is consumed as a commodity symbol, much in the same way as the bomb atomic bomb was during this era. The next connection between the female body and the atomic bomb as concurrent commodity symbols was associated with an annual beauty contest held in North Las Vegas. The 1953 winner of this pageant, Paula Harris, was nicknamed Miss A-Bomb after appearing in a parade on a Chamber of Commerce float depicting the popular spy movie, The Atomic City. The Chamber's float declared North Las Vegas to be as new and modern as the A-Bomb and linked this beauty queen with the celebration of the modern, both of which were supposed to attract visitors to Las Vegas. The fact that this movie was actually set in Los Alamos, New Mexico, was irrelevant to the people of Las Vegas. The atomic city as a signifier could just as easily be linked to Las Vegas as Los Alamos. And this is in fact what happened. Las Vegas took as its nickname the atomic city, replacing its designation as the gateway to Boulder Dam after Boulder Dam quit being the site that everyone wanted to visit. Miss Q, the third woman associated with atomic beauty pageants, was named after Operation Q, a bombing scheduled for late April 1955, which was delayed numerous times due to weather. So during one of the delays, the military personnel took off to Las Vegas. They kind of got sick of waiting, and an impromptu beauty contest to entertain the soldiers happened at the Sands Hotel. The winner of this contest was named Miss Q to signify the misfiring of Operation Q, and she is crowned with a mushroom cloud. The mushroom cloud acts both as adornment on the woman's body and additional marker of her role as atomic beauty queen. The military men who surround and crown her connect the mushroom cloud to the woman's body, much like Miss Atomic Blast. The way the mushroom cloud, symbol of atomic weapons, is here connected to the female form shows the narrative these atomic beauty pageants helped create in post-war America, a story where atomic weapons were not scary, but rather tamed under our control and a symbol of beauty. The final Miss Atomic Bomb, depicted in a 1957 publicity photo for the Sands Hotel, is also the most iconic of the atomic beauty queens. You can find this picture on the left on refrigerator magnets. You can get a mouse pad that has her on it. Um, she really was all over the place in the 50s, and even today, this is a really popular picture to depict that time. Her name is Lee Merlin, but that was forgotten for most of the history of this photo. She was just an unnamed beauty queen. The picture depicts Merlin in the Nevada desert, dressed only in high heels and swimsuit. However, her swimsuit is adorned with a mushroom cloud made out of cotton balls. The mushroom cloud covers most of her torso and her nude colored swimsuit, so it appears to be the thing which provides decency to her body, which is otherwise fully on display in the photo. The camera angle, in addition to her outstretched arms, provides a larger than life perspective. Her wide mouth grin, closed eyes, and arms thrown above her head lend the photo an exuberant quality, which gives the viewer a sense that Merlin is excited about the nuclear future. This photo has become representative representative of the atomic craze in 1950s pop culture, and it represents just how completely the mushroom cloud had been domesticated through its repetition. No longer signifying dread or anguish, the mushroom cloud that covered Merlin's swimsuit, created by photographer Don English, was a way to distinguish his photo from all the other photos about the mushroom cloud out there. He said, we were shooting so many atom bombs, we tried to do anything that was a little bit different. By superimposing the mushroom cloud over Merlin's body, English not only created a memorable photo, but also made clear that the mushroom cloud had been fully distanced from its origins as an image of destruction. In the 12 years between the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the time that English took this photo, the cultural significance of the mushroom cloud has shifted. Through sheer repetition, the image had been tamed. As a reporter said, quote, Everyone loves Miss Atomic Bomb. You take something that was frightening, the bomb, you make it more mundane or comical. You make it something you can deal with. Through the dissemination of images like this one of Miss Atomic Bomb, 
the historical significance of nuclear weapons was erased. The idea of making the atomic bomb something you can deal with expresses the needs that American felt, Americans felt to reconcile the negative aspects of the world in which they lived and the sanitation of the mushroom cloud through Las Vegas publicity photos provided an outlet to accomplish this. Don English was the photographer of a series of photos which ran in the June 28, 1953 issue of the Oakland Tribune depicting this ballet dancer doing a series of poses with a mushroom cloud in the background. The photos were taken during Operation Upshot Knot Hole on April 6, 1952. And this photo shoot, rather than an advertisement, seems to be an attempt to interpret the impact of the atomic tests in an artistic way. Yet the photos still contrast the image of the mushroom cloud with a woman's form and dramatize the unfolding of the mushroom cloud, which is both framed and tamed through a series of poses entitled Angel Dance. The photos depict a young dancer, Sally McCloskey, in black leotard doing a series of four poses in the Nevada desert, framing and interacting with the mushroom cloud as it develops and grows. The story dramatizes the event in the caption, which reads, High, 6,000 feet, over the yawning canyons of the west, a young girl cavorted recently in what could be the dance of the century. Her name, Sally McCloskey, chorus girl from Las Vegas Plush Sands Hotel. The place, the gravelly summit of Angel's Peak. Her task, to interpret the greatest drama of our time in dance rhythms. For high over her sinuous leaping form rose a symbol no eye could miss, the pale rising cloud of an atomic bomb just exploded 40 miles away. Um, Yes and no. They did a bunch of those tests and people, they did a lot of tests in the 50s where military were closer than they should have been so they could see what the effects would be. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about the effect on people that lived in Utah. So, so I don't know what happened to her, but yeah, that's pretty close. But it wasn't unusual. So the series of photos each had different captions to explain what she's doing and the meaning behind these poses that she's dancing. The poses read counterclockwise from the top left. One, apprehension starts dance. Two, which illustrates impact. Three, goes on to symbol of awe. Four, climax of dance, which took place at dawn in temperature little above freezing. In brisk pose, Sally calls survival. <coughs> The need to domesticate the image is clear as the narration leads the dancer and the audience through the stages from fear to survival. As Kyle McClear states in Beclouded Visions, Hiroshima Nagasaki and the Art of Witness, the mushroom cloud swells with each new interpretation. Immaculately conceived in some eyes, it looms as a phantasmic metaphor of the sublime. For others, it pivots and juts beyond any imaginable containment, leaking through descriptive captions like noxious gas, interminable obscene. Interpretations of the mushroom cloud, such a nodal image in post-war consciousness, should alert us to the fact that meanings are not uniform. Images evoke competing memories, informed in part by shifting social and political requirements. All images rely on narrative hooks for their meanings. As McClear notes, meanings aren't uniform, and the way that narratives are created and represented reveal underlying motivations. Stepping away from the image of the mushroom cloud as disconnected from its historical reality, I want to view this next image to bring us away from pop culture and back to this historical and political <coughs> significance of atomic weapons. So we're going to watch a short time-lapse video of every nuclear explosion since Trinity in 1945. And the lights are the explosions, and you'll see a count running up in the top, um, and the year and the date up in the top right corner, and flags for each new nuclear power as they develop and start testing nuclear weapons.
So you can really see things heat up as the Cold War tensions kind of ebb and flow between the US and the USSR. So here at the end, it's going through and giving you a running count of each country and showing the regions of their tests. So that's a good image to show you more of the, the historical significance of that. If you remember me saying at the beginning that rhetoric from wars of the 19th century were carried over into atomic testing, you can see how Britain and the United States and France carry out a lot of their testing in their colonial areas. So a lot of testing in the US was done in the Pacific, um, France and Africa, Britain in their colonies. Um, so. With that map of nuclear detonations, I want to move my presentation from pop culture back to the way that the fallout has affected US citizens. Terry Tempest Williams' memoir, Refuge, engages with the issue of atomic testing in Nevada in a very different way than we saw in the 50s. Williams, who grew up in Utah, connects the atomic tests with the history of breast cancer that runs through generations of her family affecting her grandmother, aunts, mother, and herself. In the final chapter of Refuge, her meditation on family, religion, and connection to the land, she realizes that this history is intimately connected to the history of atomic testing. She and her family are downwinders, the closest equivalent in the US to the Japanese Hibakusha. Downwinders, most of whom live in Utah, were exposed to radiation throughout the years of above ground testing at the Nevada test site. The wind mostly took it to the east from Nevada. And the testing moved underground in the 60s um, with the test ban treaty, the limited test ban treaty. So she grew up in this period where the tests were being held. And I want to take us to a link which shows this last chapter of her memoir, which she calls The Clan of One Breasted Women and just read a bit of excerpts from it. She says, I belong to a clan of one-breasted women. My mother, my grandmothers, and six aunts have all had mastectomies. Seven are dead. The two who survive have just completed rounds of chemotherapy and radiation. I've had my own problems, two biopsies for breast cancer, and a small tumor removed between my ribs diagnosed as a borderline malignancy. This is my family history. 
Most statistics tell us breast cancer is genetic, hereditary, with rising percentages attached to fatty diets, childlessness, or becoming pregnant after 30. What they don't say is living in Utah may be the greatest hazard of all. Two years ago, after my mother's death from cancer, my father and I were having dinner together. He had just returned from St. George, where his construction company was putting in natural gas lines for towns in southern Utah. He spoke of his love for the country, the sandstone landscape, bare-boned and beautiful. He had just finished hiking the Kolob Trail in Zion National Park. We got caught up in reminiscing, recalling with fondness our walk up Angel's Landing on his 50th birthday, and the years our family had vacationed there. This was a remembered landscape where we had been raised. Over dessert, I shared a recurring dream of mine. I told my father that for years, as long as I could remember, I saw this flash of light in the night in the desert, that this image had so permeated my being, I could not venture south without seeing it again on the horizon, illuminating buttes and mesas. You did see it, he said. Saw what, I asked, a bit tentative. The bomb, the cloud. We were driving home from Riverside, California. You were sitting on your mother's lap. She was pregnant. In fact, I remember the date, September 7, 1957. We had just gotten out of the service. We were driving north past Las Vegas. It was an hour or so before dawn when this explosion went off. We not only heard it, but felt it. I thought the oil tanker in front of us had blown up. We pulled over and suddenly, rising from the desert floor, we saw it clearly, this golden-stemmed cloud, the mushroom. The sky seemed to vibrate with an eerie pink glow. Within a few minutes, a light ash was raining on the car. I stared at my father. This was new information to me. I thought you knew that, my father said. It was a common occurrence in the 50s. It was at that moment I realized the deceit I had been living under. Children growing up in the American Southwest, drinking contaminated milk from contaminated cows, even from the contaminated breasts of their mothers, my mother, members years later of the clan of one-breasted women. It is a well-known story in the desert west, the day we bombed Utah, or perhaps the years we bombed Utah. Above ground atomic testing in Nevada took place from January 27, 1951 through July 11, 1962. The winds were blowing north, covering low-use segments of the population in Utah with fallout and leaving sheep dead in their tracks, and the climate was right. The United States of the 1950s was red, white, and blue. The Korean War was raging. McCarthyism was rampant. Ike was it, and the Cold War was hot. If you were against nuclear testing, you were for a communist regime. Much has been written about this American nuclear tragedy. Public health was secondary to national security. The Atomic Energy Commissioner, Thomas Murray, was quoted as saying, gentlemen, we must not let anything interfere with this series of tests, nothing. Again and again, the public was told by its government, in spite of burns, blisters, and nausea, it has been found that the tests may be conducted with adequate assurance of safety under conditions prevailing at the bombing reservation. Assaging public fears was simply a matter of public relations. A news release typical of the time stated, we find no basis for concluding that harm to any individual has resulted from radioactive fallout. And she goes on to describe um, the lawsuit of the people who had been affected against the US government and how they did reach a settlement. And then later her own activism in the desert. And she kind of moves into a dreamlike state to describe what that was like for her. So you can see parallels between this and the Japanese atomic bomb literature of that sort of official language permeating the narrative. And I want to just end from there with this final slide, which is a quote by Dorothy Thompson that says, peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of creative alternatives for responding to conflict. Alternatives to passive or aggressive responses, alternatives to violence. And I think that's what literature has to offer us when viewing these sorts of issues, not just atomic weapons, but the narratives that we create about peace and conflict in our society. So thank you for listening.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want my, uh, I've been asked to pose a couple of questions that will prompt discussion. But in lieu of questions, I have a couple of observations and themes that I would like to just put out there and uh, see what, what manifests as a result of the themes that I, I heard and thought about in response to Ms. Williams' presentation, which was excellent. Uh, I want to begin first by talking about some basic ideas and concepts. And I want to begin with the pop culture part before I forget it, because there's a couple of things that linger in my mind. The word fallout becomes a very central uh, narrative device, as well as an aesthetic feature, uh, as, as the, the atomic literature and the speculative fiction that Ms. Williams so aptly describes uh, starts to manifest over time. It's uh, no doubt that there is also a pop culture fallout that exists as a result of these narrations. Uh, if you pay attention to the video game world in any way, shape, or form, you'll note that the most popular, and I wrote down the fact before I got here just to make sure I had it, but uh, the consumption of the nuclear narrative has not gone away. It's actually exponentially increased in terms of how we consume it and how we represent it. Uh, the video game Fallout 4, which was recently released, is projected to be the number one selling game of all time. And in its first quarter, it's projected that it will sell 235 million US adjusted dollars in North America alone. And uh, it, if you know anything about the game, it is this kind of, it's called a sandbox game, which allows you to participate in a post-apocalyptic world as a result of a nuclear winter. So there is, all these aesthetics still come to play and they're culturally reproduced over time. So these questions about atomic dish detergent and about atomic beauty queens uh, becoming these uh, commodified forms of the consumption of the nuclear narrative, uh, they're still very present today. And uh, I just want to uh, I just want to put that out there as, as a point of departure. Another thing that I noticed was this question of clinical language and the romance of the nuclear weapon, so or weapons of mass destruction writ large. There is. Um, I recall two years ago I worked as an advisor to the president on the Syrian missile crisis. And one of the discussions that took place was about narrative. I was quite surprised to know that and to see that that was actually a welcome part of the discussion. But one of the questions was the politics of attention. To what extent does the romance of a gas, an ethereal gas, a deadly gas, an invisible force that then turns the body into a grotesque creature and horrifies us, is also related to the, the urgency with which we prioritize and narrativize nuclear weapons. So I was, I note that in the, the map, the, the time sequence map where the explosion were, explosions were taking place, there's not any numbers associated with megaton yield and also the impact of the nuclear weapons, mostly because people don't like to talk about the direct physical impact and the megaton yield. Uh, Sandia Labs just put out an interactive website that talks about, and you can actually even do an interactive thing and you can take any of those weapons that have been um, that have been detonated, and you can apply it to any place. You can put one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and see what uh, uh, fat boy, um, fat man and little boy, what, what, what they would have done if they did in Albuquerque. And the striking, the striking thing that I noticed is that the AK-47, one of the most deadly devices in the world, far outweighs uh, the, the, the megaton yield of a nuclear device, uh, a daisy bomb is far more powerful and far more deadly historically than a sarin gas weapon. However, there is a romance and an urgency that's ascribed to these, and this is partially why the narrative and the literature of nuclear, the speculative fiction is so important because it helps us to understand the relationship we have with the language and the narration of these particular weapons, not just their impact, because the impact, clin clinical as they can be, they create a void in understanding our complicity in these particular issues. I'm drawn to a quote by Deleuze and Watari uh, that um, um, this is going to be a, a paraphrasing of it, but they did write about the atom in, in uh, the Thousand Plateaus, and they said that the mystery of the atom permits people to avoid our complicity and, like all forms of power, allows its ability to be silent to appease these parts of society that want to feel guilt for its actions, while also wanting to avoid giving up its power. So how does one deal with the contradiction of being able to do that? That's one of the reasons that the speculative fiction aspect of this is such a powerful force. Uh, um, and then I'm drawn to some final thoughts on structural power. You notice those uh, detonations and the, the nation states that are given credit for those dis de uh, detonations. There's a political fallout that happens after World War II. And one of them is the structural politics that we become accustomed to in order to gain a voice in the world stage. 
in order to be a member of veto power in the U uh, UN Security Council, you have to have a nuclear weapon. And that sends a signal to other powers that in order to have veto power, the power to silence another probably opposing political objective, you have to have this kind of weapon. So it becomes a proxy. And so those sorts of proxies then have their other massive, massive structural implications. If, you're, if you have a nuclear weapon, how do you maintain one? How do you maintain and modernize your stockpile? You allow a weapon that you didn't intend to be detonated, but has very real explosive powers. Do you allow it to decay? Do you allow it to be left unchecked? What is the cost associated with that? And then in recent political documents, and I'm saying within the past 30 years, the discourse, for example, on the, the Radiation Employees Compensation Act, there is also this other type of narration that takes place, which tries to redeem, while at the same time not trying to address the particular the particular original political objective of these nuclear weapons. So there's lots of politics. So these major themes I put in terms of aesthetics, politics of attention, uh, the political fallout of these structures of power, ethics, and also embodiment, the emphasis of the initial impact and the yield, and not on all the other things that are complicit in the production of these weapons. And then finally, questions of sovereignty, because these are questions about awe and wonder. And I'm often drawn to Thomas Hobbes' question of the Leviathan, if the nuclear weapon is a version of the Leviathan in our modern age, to what extent are we able to let go of these power dynamics that we somehow, at the same time we decry, at the same time we feel shame and guilt about, but at the same time we support and we propagate in order to feel a sense of awe and wonder about the political relationships we have to the world around us. These are complicated, and in most, at best they are contradictory, which is why I love Nietzsche's uh, work and his theories on, no on language and knowledge is that we are contradictions and that we are, we bifurcate the truth from the language itself. And so um, I credit Ms. Williams for talking about this and to explore these matters further, particularly in the colonial context that you, that, that you bring them up. That was a whole lot of splurring <laughs> up, so. I'm sure there was a point that somebody could respond to in that, so I hope there is. I wanted to ask you, um, you discussed Who were affected by the bomb, but what about those in Los Alamos? For example, there's the Green Glass Sea and that entire series. There's also Tiger Eyes. And how does this uh, how does this compare to not only adding to the I guess colonial conflict, but as a means of for Los Alamos trying to um, protect yet reconcile uh, fail to reconcile but protect their actions yeah. within making the bomb. I think that's a really good point, um, and it's something that I haven't gotten a chance to get into. I've dealt mostly with the writings by the Hibakusha, and then this sort of pop culture angle, because no one has done anything on that. So that's what I've been trying to bring out, but I think you're making a really important point about Los Alamos and their position in it, um, and particularly with the scientists and the secrecy, and that's still something that's ongoing. Like if people work at Los Alamos now, there are still these these narratives that um, can't be discussed. So I don't really have a good answer for that. I think it's something interesting that if I finish my dissertation and get more time, I would love to look more into this because there was so much more that I just didn't have time for. Um, that's one of the things. One of the things is the naming of things, um, how tests were named after different Native American tribes, and the whole aspect of testing in the Pacific and the Bikini Atoll and things like that. So there's just all of these different threads that I keep finding really interesting and don't have time to pull out. I do have another question. Okay. What, about the, what about nuclear power? And like the ideas that we can achieve much greener energy, supposedly from um, using nuclear as a means, as an alternative, and how it can be used for peace, or even like nuclear nuclear use in Japan after, mm -hmm. after this, or nuclear use in Russia being used as power sources or contentions in Iran, like Iran, so. I think that's another issue that, like you were saying about um, the political power and how countries deal with this. I think that's another one where we are in a climate crisis, and there's talks going on in Paris right now about that. Um, but the new building of the facility there that is like 
42 football fields stacked on top of each other that's attempting to be a fission reactor rather than, or sorry, fusion, sorry, fusion reactor rather than fission. Yeah, that's something that I don't feel like I have the technical knowledge to really approach very, um, with any sort of degree of authority because I think that it's just such a complicated situation that we as a world are in and nuclear weapons and nuclear power show one aspect of that and then global warming um, and fossil fuels show another aspect of that and I think that I don't know enough about the use of atomic power as other than as a weapon um, to really speak authoritatively on that. So I don't have good answers to either of your questions. But <laughs> I'm I, sorry. I, I do give credit to what you're trying to achieve because uh, the order of the order of operations matters. Mm -hmm. Is that had had nuclear power been introduced before a nuclear weapon was introduced, this would be a much different narration that would have taken place, and the way in which nuclear power would have been configured and presented to the public would have been a much mm -hmm. different thing. So how you characterize this, I think, speaks directly to whether or not we permit ourselves to think about nuclear power on its own terms, rather than as Connected the legacy, the, fall, the question mm -hmm. of fallout again. Mm -hmm. right, <clears throat> right after the end of World War II, Norman Cousins, the editor of Saturday Review, and, and others started writing very critically about the use of the atomic bombs. Um, and then in 19, February 1947, Henry Stimson published mm -hmm. an article in Harper's that became the basis, the mythological basis for the mythology associated with, with the use of the bombs. Did you have a chance to look at um, Norman Cousins' writings and did you see any um, residual effect? Was Henry Stimson defense? Um, he was an old man. He was the Secretary of Defense during World War II and, and McGeorge Bundy or his brother ghost wrote the article. Mm -hmm. It was it was it's a very important article. It was um, recommended by James Conant, the president mm -hmm. of Harvard, who was a big supporter of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I haven't read that. I've read um, a biography of James Conant, and that article gets addressed in some of the other works that I've read. Um, so I haven't looked at that one directly. Mostly, like I said, I've focused on the writings that came out of Japan after the war. Should that include Godzilla? <laughs> it should, yes. Um, and that would be the Japanese sort of pop culture reaction that's trying to deal with nuclear fallout, um, the ongoing effect. And so it's kind of their cultural imagination in the pop culture side, the way that Duck and Cover, Bert the Turtle, is on the American side. Um, and even really interesting documentaries done by the D Department of Defense about if you, there's one called House in the Middle, which is all about the house in the middle is really well kept, and that's the one that's going to survive the nuclear war. So if you keep your lawn clean and your house well painted, then that's going to be the thing to save you. So that would be the Japanese um, side of that would be Godzilla. Two, two of the big books and films that that, be, that were critical in the anti in the telling the other side of the story were on the beach and Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. Did you have a chance to mm -hmm. evaluate and talk to those? Yeah, I've looked at Doctor Strangelove, and about four or five years ago, I taught a class in the English department on atomic culture, and we looked at that there. Um, and it's always really interesting to me to see students' reactions to these things that were coming out during that period. Um, but yeah, Dr. Strangelove is definitely something that I've worked in in a different context than what I presented here. So that's something that's in my consciousness but just didn't come out in this presentation. There was so much that I couldn't include that it's hard to know what to cut and what to address. Okay. Uh, I'm the student of the history and philosophy of science from the University of Leeds. I haven't come all the way to see you. Really. <laughs> um, I've got a, qu a couple of questions about portrayal of <clears throat> um, science just, mm -hmm. and the scientists. Mm -hmm. So we kind of come central to our discipline is the idea that science doesn't happen in a vacuum. 
and that scientists shape how they themselves are seen and are also shaped by society. So what was the kind of agency of the scientists in kind of create in this atomic culture? Mm -hmm. And do you think they were kind of glorified or vilified? A little of both. Um, so during the Manhattan Project, a lot of the scientists who were working there were from Europe. So there were a lot of Jewish scientists who had come from Hungary, Germany, other places, and had been recruited for their work um, on this project. And like I said, it was shrouded in secrecy and up until the bombs were dropped in Japan. So I don't think they really shaped much of the public opinion about it up until after that point. And after that point, there was a lot of regret. Like when you saw Oppenheimer on that movie, um, and with the tear he shed and how they were talking about, I think we all felt this like gravity of the situation. That was definitely a lot of the narrative. Um, Albert Einstein and several of the other scientists wrote a letter to the president saying they didn't think that this weapon should be used after it was developed. So you can see them dealing with their complicity in this. And then afterwards, during the Cold War, Robert Oppenheimer was really vilified throughout all the 50s um, and went from this position of being a celebrated scientist to one who was really denounced by Joe McCarthy in the McCarthyism era. So it kind of is a little of both of those. And I see the scientists, a lot of them, as feeling that sort of, like I think that's why the Bhagavad Gita describes it so well, is this was their role that they were doing. They, we didn't want Hitler to get an atomic weapon first, so there was a lot of urgency about that. Um, but also they recognized the majority of them that they had developed this power which was really destructive. There were a few outliers in that, and a couple of scientists really pushed for the development of the hydrogen bomb. Um, so, much bigger. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> First, thank you both. This program was great. Your talk was great. This one was great. Um, I was interested in the sort of religious attachment mm -hmm. and the of the Salamos and then sort of the truth of. Um, so I wondered if you wanted to either say more about the ways that the Salamos sort of appropriated or borrowed things, or else is there any kind of analog in the writings that came out of Japan about the bombs, which is like, are there ways that a sort of religious power, or like great spiritual power, was also attached to the bomb from mm -hmm. victims? And yeah. I, from what I've read of the literature that comes out of Japan, I don't see that at all. It's a very different <coughs> way of dealing with it, where it's a lot, it deals a lot with the question of ethics, like you raised, um, and how do we live in a world where this can happen. And like the quote that I read about the idea of the metaphor about hell, um, that's something that comes up throughout is this isn't hell, it's human caused. Um, so I would see the literature in Japan, in Japan not turning towards that, it's more trying to understand how a human world could do this. Um, and then as far as different type of appropriations like that in the Manhattan Project, there's a lot of different language in there that appropriates not just religious imagery, but there's rhetoric of like death and creation throughout. Um, when I read the telegram about the New World, has, they've landed in the New World and it was successful. So a lot of times if they were talking about their successes, they would say it's a boy. So a boy is a success and a girl is a failure. So there's like gendered imagery there too. Um, and a lot of imagery of like, male procreation, like male birthing power. So it was their baby. Um, and so that's tying back into this idea of like creating a new world um, and the creation of that rather than just sheer destruction.
So I don't know if that answers it. Although kaiju culture, kaiju culture in Japan as it develops after World War II, there is a deep kind of <laughs> sacredness that's embedded in popular culture in Japan that, that, that I think sometimes, because it's Godzilla, we don't want to mm -hmm. think that it has a sacred characteristic. Um, um, Guillermo del Toro's film Pacific Rim, not the best film in the world, but it really is a love letter to that moment in Japan where you have two things. You have nature as a force that was attacking you, fighting these mech robots that become a part of the cultural consciousness of Japan for a long time. It's anime, it's, it's narrative storytelling is about robots and giant monsters. Why? Because human beings can hide inside of the robots to protect themselves from these organic monsters that have attacked them. And so is there, there is an element of that sacredness that is narrated in that, in, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually one thing I think you can see that in the literature too is in their way of talking about nature. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned the crazy iris, which is this iris growing right after the bomb. And there's a lot of images like that where authors will note what's growing at that point. Um, and I think that's a potential way to see that working as well. Um, coming from Los Alamos, this is a very cool. Um, the real problem is that this isn't a narrative even talked about in Los Alamos. A lot of people don't know the actual history. Between, <laughs> like, we have a statue of Oppenheimer, which is put up, and we have a street named after him, but mm -hmm. nobody knows his actual political. Like, a lot of people. I'm, I'm not going to say nobody, but um, it's not taught in school. We we never learned like the actual historical significance of Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we weren't taught, like, actually most of it was talking about, like, what's the science behind atomic bombs? And what's the narrative now is actually pretty important to what you were discussing mm -hmm. with pop culture and how everything in Los Alamos, like, you said, like, um, they call themselves the atomic city in Nevada, but Los Alamos is still the atomic mm -hmm. city here, too. We have atomic imagery everywhere. We do have pictures of the bomb. We do have some of this, this still consumering, like, consumer imagery attached to everything in Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. And not only that, there's, there's an acceptance, uh, especially after the Cold War, like, especially with the older population, that the bomb isn't really a problem because it led to so many different things. A lot of people only associate Los Alamos with the bomb, but they push back against that and then fail to recognize where it, where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. Like bathtub row is still the most like most expensive houses in Los Alamos, even though they're really crummy, but they're small and that's where everything stemmed from. And so it's very interesting to see because there's no narrative in Los Alamos about this. There's no narrative of we were never we should be the ones who are reading the the writings of those when the bomb was dropped on, and there's no discussion of that. In fact, the Green Glass Sea was an optional reading for one of my classes <laughs> once. That's, and that's a narrative of talking about basically colonialism, of how the bomb was a good thing to this like young girl. So That's yeah. really interesting to hear. <laughs> um, I think it shows just how these ways of dealing with history and politics continue on. Um, and that sort of secrecy that Los Alamos was founded on seems to still really be carrying on, not just on the, in the labs, but in the culture as well. Isn't there about to be a national monument celebrating that whole thing? Uh, well, there's, no, 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 there's Bandelier. That's, that's, no, Los Alamos. Right, right, right. Los Alamos, Los Alamos is becoming, there's becoming a park, there's an atomic park that's yeah. going to be that and enacted. Oak Ridge and well, and there's a park in Colorado where, I don't remember if it was, there had been nuclear stored there or if there were testing, Rocky but yeah, the Rocky Rocky Mountain Rocky Park. Um, and that's a really interesting example of what happens because, because it was a closed off space, it's been kind of become a wildlife refuge. Um, and that has happened in uh, Russia as well, in Chernobyl, where they've seen resurgence of certain wildlife populations because it's a space where no humans are anymore. So, in Chernobyl? No, in Flats. In the <laughs> memorial? I've never been there, yeah. so I don't know. I'm more about the perhaps the colonial mindset or some of the 
theoretical ways in which um, we can sort of imagine, like, from the, the wars with native peoples in, you know, the earliest settlements in this continent, um, all the way through to that, uh, to the image that you showed where people, where, like, France and England were um, <coughs> detonating bombs in there. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes formal colonial state. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Sure. I think with the choice of New Mexico and Nevada as the spots in America where testing and development was going to happen, you can really see a 19th century sort of manifest destiny lens influencing that. So New Mexico, White Sands, and then the Nevada test site were chosen because they were far away from population centers. They were lands that were considered not really productive. Um, so you can look back to the mindset of homesteading and the Homestead Act of like improving the land um, and this move westward, conquering the frontier and the sort of Garden of Eden that was supposed to come out of the west. These were areas that didn't really fit into that narrative, so they were attractive to the military because of that. So they're not really productive farming areas. They don't have a lot of people. Um, they were termed virtually uninhabited lands, despite the fact that there were native peoples on them. The Shoshone in Nevada and then the San Ildefonso Pueblo here. Um, so kind of just pushing that aside and viewing this land as that. And then you can really see it with the naming of the tests after Native American tribes, too. So I think there's one for practically every tribe in the nation. Um, and this continued with the military as well. I think the operation just a couple of years ago was called Geronimo. Um, and there was a lot of pushback against that in Iraq. Um, and yeah, you see it happening with France and England as well, where a lot of the testing was done in their colonial nations. I don't think you saw one test happen in France, but you saw a lot happen in Africa, and you saw a lot happening in the Pacific with both the US and England. So using the logic of what had worked in the past and carrying that forward through military operations into the 20th century. So since these wars had been successful for these colonial powers, they continued that logic into what was happening now. Uh, not only did they lie to the soldiers, mm -hmm. the nuclear workers, but uh, like the poor Navajo miners, the mm -hmm. Iranian miners, there's some book came out called Yellow Dirt mm -hmm. by investigative report from the Los Angeles Times that detailed all the all the horrible things that have happened to the people that were involved in Iranian mining tribes and their families because mm -hmm. people took the dust home. It just got everywhere about their families. So there was absolutely no incidence of cancer in the Navajo tribe before during the mining. Mm -hmm. And now they have terrible stuff going on. So it's it's a continuing thing and, and mm -hmm. there is a whole lot of stuff with nuclear energy, the disposal problem, mm -hmm. the mining problem, any anything you can work with it, it becomes contaminated. And so to say it's a clean energy source, I think so it's like clean coal <laughs> and several other mis total misnomers. It's not clean. We haven't figured out how to deal with this stuff in all the years. And I don't think we ever will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you.